Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel and thanks for joining us. In this video, we will explain why it can be confusing to study code found in a C++ standard library implementation. Observations about the C++ standard library. The developers who work on implementing the standard library must have a solid understanding of the language. We believe their knowledge and experience of C++ is top-notch and it makes perfect sense to study their work. But is it really the best code to learn from? The code in a standard library implementation uses odd syntax, breaks rules application developers should never breach, and most of it is tricky to understand. Beyond the styling issues, Looking closely at their code shows they often use parts of the language which are typically avoided in modern C++ applications. To illustrate why standard library code may not be ideal for learning, let's look at a method taken directly from two different implementations, then rewrite the code as a typical developer would so it is readable and understandable then we will be in a better position to decide if this is really a good way to become proficient in C++. The standard library is really an API which defines a set of classes and functions. There are various implementations of the standard library and they do not always agree with each other and in some rare cases do not fully match the API. Places like Stack Overflow are full of questions and comments, insisting the code written by a developer of a standard library implementation must be a good example of well-written code. So then why is it so convoluted and seems to violate most good programming practices? Here is the first issue. The code is well-written if you are implementing the standard library and you have the freedom to break the rules, close your eyes to undefined behavior, and do not mind a lot of underscores. This is not the world most programmers are part of. We need to stop thinking standard library implementation code is well written, and instead be grateful that it is not. We want a standard library implementation which is efficient and correct. Our understanding is these developers work closely with the compiler teams to take advantage of internals that normal developers should never use and in most cases cannot use. There are three primary implementations of the standard library and they each correspond to a specific compiler. Code should work with any standard library implementation, but to ensure it does, you need to test with every compiler and its corresponding standard library. Let's start by looking at the way things are named. What do programmers have to consider when they choose an identifier? An identifier is the name of something like a variable, class name, or function. A scope indicates where an identifier is declared. The standard has multiple rules about naming an identifier and whether or not it can begin with an underscore. For an identifier to be valid, it must begin with a non-digit character, and you cannot use an existing keyword. The first set of rules about underscores apply to every identifier in any scope. It is not legal to name an identifier starting with two underscores. The other rule says you cannot start an identifier with an underscore followed by a capital letter. According to the standard, violating either one of these is undefined behavior. Current day compilers will not report this as a warning. You simply need to know the rules and follow them. The term global scope refers to any function or declaration which is not located in a class or a namespace which has a name. Any function in an anonymous or unnamed namespace is also considered part of the global scope. 
Here is the less obvious rule. Local variables inside a global function are not part of the global scope, even though the global function itself is part of the global scope. For the global scope, there is one additional rule. You cannot declare an identifier whose name starts with an underscore. The rules in the global scope are more strict. As an example, in our template declaration, we are declaring a parameter named underscore r, which is undefined behavior in any scope. But if you have looked at code from any standard library implementation, you will notice they use leading underscores everywhere. So why can they break the rules? Actually, they're not. Implementers of the standard library are required to use a leading underscore for their identifiers to avoid naming collisions with user application code. This is not just a coding style, but a design constraint they must follow. The fact it makes the code harder to read is simply one of the challenges of working on the standard library. In the standard library implementation we are going to look at, there is a call to placement new. Let's take a brief look at how this differs from a traditional call to operator new. Example 1 should be very familiar to most C++ programmers. This one line of code does four things. It declares a variable, allocates memory, instantiates an object, and then initializes the variable to point to the new object. This is the normal way to create a new object on the heap by calling operator new. Example 2 is a call to placement new. This code separates the memory allocation from the object instantiation. The first line of code in this example declares a variable and then allocates a block of memory using malloc, nothing more. The second line invokes the new operator and passes an extra parameter. By passing PTR before the data type, the new operator will omit the allocation step and simply instantiate a new widget object in the block of memory pointed to by PTR. The pointer variables obj1 and obj2 can be used to access the new widget objects. The pointer PTR contains the same address as obj2, but keep in mind, PTR is not a pointer to a widget, so it cannot be used to access any methods or data in the widget class. One of the most common use cases for placement new is when implementing containers. Since every implementation of the standard library will provide containers, like STD vector, seeing a placement new in their code is reasonable. Calling placement new in a user application should be used with caution and is often unnecessary. Here is one of the potential problems with calling placement new. Let's look at the first two lines of this example. The first line is exactly the same as before. In the second line, we are calling placement new to construct a new widget in the memory pointed to by PTR. So far, this example seems the same. But notice, this time, we are not saving the result of calling placement new on line A. Line B does a static cast of PTR, which returns a pointer to the widget. This seems reasonable, since there really is a widget at that address on the heap. However, there's a problem. The language in the C++ standard defines using obj3 to access the widget is undefined behavior. We did not expect this, and it feels like a mistake. It turns out the reason this is undefined behavior is because of the rules for compiler optimizers. They are allowed to assume certain facts 
about pointers and the access to OBJ3 could be reordered before the object widget is instantiated. In C++ 20, STD Launder was added to resolve this conflict. On line C, STD Launder instructs the compiler to disregard the original data type of PTR. The variable obj4 can be used to safely access the widget. We have copied a small segment of code from two different standard library implementations. The first one is from the Microsoft implementation, and the other is from libstdc++, which is used with the GCC compiler. The two templated methods we are showing have different names, yet they have almost identical functionality. They might be called when appending a new element to a vector. We have preserved the original syntax and formatting. This is exactly how they look in the standard library headers. The purpose of these methods is to construct an object. Notice that both of these contain a call to placement new. This means the memory allocation had to occur prior to calling one of these methods. As a quick reminder, the colon colon before the call to placement new indicates the implementation for new will be looked up only in the global scope. The developer who asked us what this code was doing said it was very hard to read, comprehend, and reason about. We realized the best way to explain the code was to start by refactoring it so it was readable. This example is showing the original Microsoft implementation in the upper section and our refactored version in the lower section. Our code reflects the styling and standard naming rules associated with a user application. Now it is a bit easier to reason about and explain what the code is doing. User application code and standard library implementation code have different rules. The refactoring started by changing the code to use identifiers which are legal in a user application. This meant removing all of the underscores. We also adjusted the formatting and changed a few variable names to improve readability. Now it is easier to see the call to placement new and the forwarding of the constructor arguments. Refactoring the method from the GCC standard library involves similar modifications. Again, most of the work involved changing identifier names. There is no technical reason why we change the template parameter name from args to t's. Using t's is our preference, but both are legal in user application code. On the other hand, there is a very good reason to change this identifier name. In their code, they used a template parameter named underscore args with an uppercase a and a method parameter named underscore args with a lowercase a. This is confusing and will make conversations about the code difficult to follow. Looking at the functionality of our refactored code, it is once again easier to see the body of the method is one statement which calls placement new. The other observation is that neither standard library implementation gives the caller access to the return value of the placement new. It seems reasonable to assume the code which called this method will access the new object. The only option is for the caller to use the pointer which was passed as PTR and cast it to the appropriate type. But as we mentioned, this is invalid according to the standard. So does this mean these standard library implementations of STD vector have undefined behavior? No, but there is a catch. The designers of a given standard library 
need to make an arrangement with compiler vendors to ensure their implementations are compiled to code, which produces the correct result. We hope the small section of code we have reviewed shows why reading standard library implementations to learn C++ is probably not a good idea. There are special rules for naming identifiers. The code often has strange backward compatibility restrictions and may depend on implementation-defined behavior. Trying to emulate their coding style in user applications will likely cause undefined behavior and is almost guaranteed to hinder readability and maintainability. For more information about the Copper Spice project, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. We would like to announce our new journal, which is a collection of articles and small GUI examples with a complete explanation of the code. Links to the source code are available from each tutorial. Thanks for watching. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions or feedback, feel free to leave a comment on this video or send us an email. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back for our next video.